And so are the donors. Y'all the best. But while I'm here, let me talk to you and give you a recap about Thanksgiving. So you know, we partnered with the Buffalo family and we asked you all for a donation. Well, we asked so we could feed 100 families a meal. We conquered that and a little bit more. She served probably over a thousand meals over that week and we were assistant to her. We also gave her about 30 hands so that she could help the people and feed the people, fix the meal, all of the boxes. So we appreciate all of your help, monetary or in the physical form. Y'all rock. I mean, just keep on going. This is what the holiday season is all about. By faith, I declare that in 2022, I will embrace all things new. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, Mark 2, 21 and 22, and 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17 provide a biblical framework for my participation in God's promise to manifest holistic newness in my life. I accept that all things new means the change God performs is not the only change taking place. Rather, I have a part to play as well. Therefore, I commit to the process of holistic renewal. I will embrace newness as I release. I will forget about what has happened and I will not keep going over old history. I will no longer regard myself or others according to the past because old things have passed away and all things are new. I let go of any problems, pain, or people who stand in the way of a fresh start, and I trade my need for closure for a desire to be open. I will embrace newness as I recover. I will be alert and present. I believe who God says I am, and I accept the grace God has given me to be. I will be present-oriented and aware of my worth as broken areas in my life are healed and I rediscover God's will for my life in this season. I will embrace newness as I reimagine. I choose to believe that what God has ahead is greater than what is behind me. I unlock the creativity I lost in my captivity, and I will offer God new wineskins for the new wine of gladness that comes with the dawning of a new day. I see unlimited possibility because nothing is impossible with God. I will embrace newness as I resume. I will walk the pathways God creates, seeing it as my chance to move forward with my life despite the conditions around me. My exile is over and I will walk by faith into new places by the power of the Holy Spirit. I will not hold back this is my time to live. I declare God sustaining grace over my family, loved ones, community, and my church. I believe that old things are passed away and all things are made new in the spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Psalm 91 says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty.
I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that starts in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show my, him my salvation. Let's go to him in grace. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for being our shelter. Thank you for being our strength. Thank you for being our Jehovah. So we make you our dwelling place tonight. God, we make you our dwelling place. God, we make you our dwelling place. We set the atmosphere to do whatever you want to do. We set the atmosphere today to move how you want to move. Shift how you want to shift. Move how you want to move. We love you, we honor you, and it is in your name we pray, amen. All right, we're gonna make one big choir, is that okay? Is that all right? That's all right? All right. Everybody clap your hands. Y'all say, oh. Jehovah, 
There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no God
personal Jehovah we thank you God we give you this moment God we surrender to you now God thank you for being the constant in a world full of variables 
And we promise never to cheat the moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody put your hands together right now. Oh, if I was clapping for me, that'd be great. But could you put your hands together for Jesus? You may be seated. I am excited. Whether you are worshiping with us tonight online or whether you're physically in the building, there is a word from the Lord on tonight. I said there is a word from the Lord on tonight. And we are excited because on tonight we are concluding. This is of the last of our uh, initial sermons. And so listen, in just a moment, we're going to bring the man of God up. But the man of God for tonight needs no introduction. He is the director of the worship and fine arts department here at the Place for Change. And we are so excited that Minister Joseph Haynes is giving us the word on tonight. So listen, do me a favor. Say this, say, preacher, you have what I need. So release it so that my life can be changed. Would you clap your hands? Would you put the hearts up if you're online and receive? Minister Joseph Haynes. Well, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph, for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, y'all. So good to see y'all tonight. First of all, first give an honor to God, who is the head of my life. Uh, we honor Bishop Rousen tonight in his absence. Can we clap our hands for the bishop? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And his lovely wife to Executive Pastor Annie in her absence to our uh, esteemed Associate Pastor Ray Rousen and Lady Tanya Rousen. But most of all, can we clap our hands for the greatest pastor on this side Pastor Cedric Rousen and Lady Nadia Rousen. We love you, we love you, we love you. Well, here we are. Here we are. Let's do what we do. This is a, this is a little bit of a different vein, but we're here tonight, all right? Um, journey with me to John chapter <laughs> Chapter 11. If nobody gonna talk back to me tonight, I know these people to my left are gonna talk back to me tonight. Hallelujah. John chapter 11. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Um, so y'all, please forgive me while I read the Bible in church. Praise the Lord. All right. We're gonna start right here at verse 3. So the sister sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Verse 17 says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, 
for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, for I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a, la on a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I want to talk for a few minutes tonight around the subject, this is not the end. Would you encourage somebody around you and just say, neighbor, this is not the end. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for the gift of this day. I thank you for the privilege of this moment. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified even now and have your way. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have your seats, you guys. We're going to talk for just a little bit. Is that all right? Y'all going to talk back to me tonight. I, I love a good talk back church. Anyone who knows me uh, knows that I am a sucker for a good movie, especially a good comedy. I was in my senior year of high school back in January of 2008 when a movie was released entitled First Sunday. The movie was centered around two petty criminals named Lee John, played by Tracy Morgan, and Darrell, played by Ice Cube. Now, Lee John and Darrell have found themselves back and forth in court several times, and at this point, they're facing jail time. Now, for Lee John, it doesn't really mean much. He doesn't have much to lose or look forward to. He really doesn't have a life. But Darrell, Darrell's different. Darrell is the father of a preteen son who is co-parenting with his son's mother who goes by the name of I'm Unique. Why they named her that, I don't know. But I'm Unique is an, is an aspiring hairstylist who has the opportunity to relocate and be better established. In order for her to stay local, she needs a lump sum of money in a short amount of time or she will be relocating with their son, DJ, and her current situationship. Darrell, who walks his son to the bus stop every day, is currently taking that walk with DJ, and at the conclusion of their conversation, DJ submits a request of his father, Darrell. DJ pleads with Darrell to not let him have to move away with his mother, and Darrell replies to him with a promise, and he says, I'm not going to let anybody take you away from me. It's from that point on that Darrell finds himself in a number of sticky situations and circumstances that ultimately leads him back in front of a judge pleading his case. Long story short, the case gets dismissed and he rushes back into the place where his son is and they are getting things ready to move away. But it's here where the money that's needed for I'm Unique to stay has been left there, causing them not to move away. DJ runs out and embraces his father Darrell and Darrell does something very interesting. He reminds his son of the initial promise that he made, saying, I told you I wasn't going to let anyone take you away from me. Prior to Lee John and Darrell being faced with so many life-altering situations, this all started with Darrell making a promise, Darrell fulfilling his promise, and Darrell reminding his son of that promise. And such is the case in how our text picks up here in John 11 with a promise. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. I want to take you back to a familiar era in church history called Sunday school. One of the most popular miracles that we've ever heard about was Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And this is the text tonight that we find ourselves in. I guess I should probably apologize for the spoiler alert a few seconds ago, y'all. That's the story as we know it. Lazarus lives. 
Sorry. All right. Over and over again, we've heard certain parts of this text repeated throughout life. Now, I told y'all I love a good talk back church, so I need y'all to talk back to me tonight. So if you ever heard of any of these pieces of the story emphasized, then just shout back at me, heard it, okay? So pieces such as Jesus calling Lazarus out of the grave. Or perhaps the infamous, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Or even one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible, Jesus wept. We have heard pieces of this scripture rehearsed and recited for the majority of our lives, but there's one thing that I'm not sure we really paid close attention to, or at least I didn't. And that was right there at the beginning of this text in verse 4, where Jesus says this small but powerful excerpt, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And here we have Jesus, who's more than likely a tired Jesus, who's fresh off of a debate in the previous chapters with his Jewish counterparts. Jesus, a Jew himself, has spent a good amount of time arguing, escaping being seized, and basically saying to them, I am who I say I am. You asked who I was, and I told you, and you still didn't believe me. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I have done all these good works, and you still don't believe me. You accuse me of blasphemy. So listen, I'll make a deal with you. Don't believe my words. Cool. Don't believe me. But at least check my credit with my work. My rep is real good. I'm, I'm good with you not taking my word that I'm the son of God. You won't believe me. That's cool. But you can at least believe the works and see that the father is in me. After all, y'all are accusing me of all of this when I'm fresh off of a miracle. I literally just healed a blind man. Jesus has literally done everything to defend himself, but sing the hymn, may the work I've done speak for me. All of this in order to explain that he is indeed the true Messiah. But yet, they attempt to seize him again, and and Jesus escapes. And he travels back across the Jordan River back across a place where there was someone who actually believed him. It was a familiar place, a place where there was some recollection of good, a place where he did not have to fight anyone to make them believe, a place where John, his beloved disciple, had baptized him in his early days. It's the place where ministry probably seemed so much easier. He didn't have to deal with this much betrayal and accusation. It was the place where everything probably seemed so simple, And I wonder tonight, have you ever gotten so deep into something that all you yearned to do was to travel back to your own personal Jordan? Where things didn't feel this hard. Where things didn't hurt this bad. Where you didn't get this much opposition. Where where you weren't getting this much pushback. Where you didn't have to exert this much energy fighting for your identity. Where you weren't questioning your own ability in something that you are typically confident. All of this, all you want is to get back to the Jordan. And so Jesus stays there a while in what seems to be his safe space. Many people begin to gather and come to Jesus and they say these words, John never performed a sign, but all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, at the Jordan, many believed in Jesus. And this probably doesn't mean much to you until the question rings in your mind. So I asked myself the question. And I said, self? And myself said, hmm? What did John say? In order to look, or in order to answer that question, you're going to have to travel back a little bit to John chapter 1, verse 29, where he declares, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that 
so he might be revealed to Israel. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him and I did not know him but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and here's what I want. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. And so Jesus having another Jordan experience is now sent word by way of Mary and Martha that the one you love is sick. Jesus now having this reaffirming reminder at the Jordan of who he is hears the news and simply replies with these magic words. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And the Bible says that when he heard, he stayed where he was two more days. And we carry on through the story where Jesus breaks the news to the disciples. And and he says this, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Now, y'all, this is not a rest or a nap that Jesus is speaking of. He's saying, y'all, brother Lazarus is dead. He's gone. He done slipped up out of here. Who got the body? When he says, I'm going there to raise him up, Jesus arrives in town to find that Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days already. And here comes Martha. Let's go. Jesus hears, she hears Jesus has now made it into town. And interestingly enough, Martha does not warmly greet Jesus. Martha doesn't give him a hug. She doesn't say, hey fam, it's good to see you. Because after all, these folks have relationships. Lest we become confused by the word sent by Martha and Mary saying, Lazarus, the one you love, is sick. He's not the only one in the family that Jesus loved. But the Bible says in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. No, she doesn't greet him with a holy kiss. She greets him with her grief and a guilt trip. If you had been here... And isn't that just like us? Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you tonight that we too are Martha. When things don't go our way or when our expectations are let down, the first thing we say to Jesus is, well, where were you? Had you stepped in or had you intervened or had you shown up? I thought you were an on-time God. And this is the problem because we will stand right in the literal presence of the Lord and still submit to our feelings we will stand right at the feet of Jesus and groan about what's not going our way and we do this realizing that we are complaining in the face of an answered prayer After all, Martha, you were the one who sent word about Lazarus with hope that Jesus would come. And now he's here and you have yet to say thank you. And I don't know, call me crazy, but this just might be a good time for us to to offer up 10 seconds of a thank you or three because Jesus showed up when you prayed for him too. He was here because you were too wrapped up in your feelings. As many thank yous as you can throw up to heaven. Come on, let's take 10 seconds and just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just in case you can't remember if you said thank you for that intervention. Here's a good time to play catch up. Thank you, Lord. I admit I was mad when you got here, but thank you. I was frustrated when you show up, but thank you. I was too down in the dumps to even recognize that you were in my midst, but thank you. But Jesus, 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 in true Jesus fashion, doesn't even respond or address her trauma. He responds with a promise. 
And he's so consistent, so faithful, never wavering. He's, in the words of P.J. Morton, uh, Morton, he's sticking to his guns till his work is done. He started this whole thing with a promise. He reinforces his promise and simply says, your brother will rise again. And Martha replies, still in her feelings. She's almost like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'll see him again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, reading this story, I initially was mad at Martha. I got an attitude with her, like, girl, don't you hear what Jesus himself is saying to you? How many times does he have to repeat himself to you before you get the point? Until I thought about my own grief. And that's when I begin to understand that that's a typical response from Martha because nothing will make you miss a clear word from the Lord like grief will. Grief will make you ignore promises. Grief will make you miss what's coming next. Grief will make you ignore answered prayers. Grief will make you miss the next step that you're supposed to take. Grief will have you to become deaf to a new directive. Grief will have you living through only a perspective of victimization. All because you are too overwhelmed with what happened that you can't hear what's happening. So Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Let me make myself clear. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing will never die. Do you believe? Roughly translated, Jesus says, this is not the end. And it's here that the pain is cleared up from Martha's ears and seemingly the grief has dissipated even if but for a moment. Just enough so that Martha replies to Jesus' questions and utters something similar to John's sentiments in John 1 and says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the Chosen One. Now, I don't really want to get stuck here, but let this be a lesson that every chance you get you ought to take the opportunity to refocus your yes and your belief. The truth is, life be lifing. Pain be paining. Hurt be hurting. But in the midst of all of that, you are going to have to open that mouth and confess, yes, Lord, I still believe. Come on, let's try it. Yes, Lord. I still believe. Come on, say it again. Yes, Lord. I still believe. Say it from your belly this time. Yes, Lord. I still believe. And now we move and Jesus almost goes through this same ordeal with Mary, the other sister. And Jesus now with Mary and others are making their way to the tomb. They arrive and Jesus says, take away the stone. Martha replies and says, this may have an odor. He's been here for four days. In other words, Jesus, this stinks. It's been too long. And that sounds like us, Lord, there's really no hope for this now. You can't do anything about it now. You can't heal it now. You can't fix it now. It's been too long. It's been four days. It's been a month. It's been six weeks. It's been 10 years. It's been 25 years. And with all that we know about Jesus and his track record, we still doubt that he's able to move on our behalf. But we will come into this sanctuary every Sunday at 10 o'clock faithfully and we will decree and declare now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think and will shout and will dance and will run and will leap and will snot and will cry and will roll around, will follow out all while still doubting. We do it faithfully every Sunday and by 10.30 we're shouting, we're running around and by 3 o'clock we're home doubting and depressed. Because somewhere in life 
we put God in a box and a specific window of time. And if he doesn't appear in that window, then he must not be able. He must not be who he says he is. He must not be as good as we testify about. But here's the problem. What time are you going on? Because the God I serve is a God who does not operate in chronos. He operates in kairos. Chronos is our time. Kairos is God's time. And because when he, because he is time, whenever he shows up, he's right on time. And I believe it's about time for another interruption in this service. If you believe without a doubt that God is still able, open your mouth in this room and just shout, he's able. So with all that's been said, here's my question, and I'm out. If it seems to be over, why still believe? Here's the answer, and we're gone. Because things don't end with your grief. It ends when he gets the glory. Because things don't end with your grief. It ends when he gets the glory. Martha says, Lord, it's been four days. This stinks. And again, Jesus goes back to his promise. But this time he puts some spice on it as if to say, all right, I'm sick of repeating myself. Did I not tell you that you will see the glory of God? Jesus looks up to heaven and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, for you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. Jesus calls out with the loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And we already know that Lazarus comes walking out of the grave. Clap, clap, yay, yay. I celebrate that miracle. I really do. But here's what gets me even more. Jesus repeats himself over and over again throughout this story. From the time he heard of Lazarus being sick, he begins to speak to everything concerning concerning Lazarus as if to say, I don't care what happens when I'm not there. This is not the end you will see the glory of God. Now, to the common eye and ear, this would seem like a contradiction or that Jesus even lied because Lazarus did indeed die. But no, 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 no. He said this will not end in death. Jesus never said Lazarus won't die. He never said that the people would not grieve. All he said was that this will not end in death. So Lazarus, hallelujah, rest up in that tomb if you must. Mary and Martha cry and grieve and moan if you must, but know that when I arrive, what I said is coming to pass. And tonight I came to encourage you with those same words that Jesus said in one way or another throughout this entire story. This will not end in death and you will see the glory of God because there is absolutely nothing that can stop a promise that God made if he said it won't end in death then it won't even if death becomes a reality because only Jesus has the power to keep the story going after the funeral after the committal and after the burial this is not the end the hurt not the end the heartbreak not the end the divorce not the end the accident not the end the diagnosis not the end the trauma not the end the betrayal not the end he made you a promise that must come to pass he that began a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This sickness, hey, 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 hey. this sickness will not end in death. Oh, and one more thing. Not only will this not end in death, but you won't end in death. So much so that every believer has a promise that even when we have to leave this earth, 
Hey, hallelujah. After they pick out our casket, after they plan our services, after all the resolutions have been read, after they dance around your casket, after they pay their last respects, after they mourn your loss, after they put us in the ground and commit our bodies back to the earth, after the phone calls stop coming, after they stop bringing chicken to your house, after they go through the series of firsts of holidays without you, some glad morning. When this life is over, I'll fly away to a land on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, but that's not the end. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory unless you think that I'm only referencing the Martha in the text no baby, I'm talking to you hey Martha, this is not the end write that book, apply for that job, start that business launch that podcast learn that instrument, compose that song, go after that promotion, go to therapy go back to school, pursue that relationship, you are not stuck, you don't have to stay here, so push until you become successful, push not until you feel better but push, not until it starts to look better push, not until you start to feel better, but push until he gets the glory push until he gets the glory push until he gets the glory for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory hey, that shall be revealed hey, hey, don't get stuck in your feelings because what you don't know in just a few short shakes this situation is going to repeat itself all over again but this time Lazarus we won't need you Lazarus you don't have to go in a tomb Lazarus you don't have to die but down at the cross where my savior died down where from cleansing from sin I cried there to my heart was the blood applied and we're singing glory we're singing glory to his name if you're ready to see the glory of God open up your mouth and shout glory is coming 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 if you've been wondering what's coming next it's called glory if you've been wondering what's happening after your struggle it's called glory so lift up your head oh ye gates be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is the king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle so can we praise him like you know glory is coming can we praise him like when no glory is coming i've been here six years there's only one way i know how to do it with my hands lifted too long. You've been frustrated too long. You've been depressed too long. I said glory is coming. Push until you feel the glory. Push. Push. You're gonna live to see it happen. You're gonna live to see it happen. Hey, you're gonna, I rebuke death in this room. Hey, I rebuke suicide in this room. Glory is coming. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, there will be glory. There will be 
glory there will be glory I dare you out of your belly open up your mouth in this room and shout like you know come on I mean out of your belly as much as you cried as much as you scream open up your mouth and shout like you know You've been in the dark too long. Rise, shine, give God the glory. Rise, shine, give God the praise. I dare you, just grab somebody's hand and just tell them glory's coming. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, glory, glory. And by the way, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. It hasn't even entered into the heart of man what the Lord has in store for you. But all I know is that it's one word, glory. Who needed that word tonight? I heard the Holy Spirit while he ministered. I don't believe in preaching behind a preacher, but I have a word of knowledge. Holy Spirit said to me, he said, the reason that some of my children are so drowned in emotionality when it comes to grief is because they have confused emotions for God. In other words, because we have equated spirituality by emotion, now we end up living up under the depression, the anxiety, the frustration, the stress of emotion. And what the Lord said to me tonight is he said, the victory this preacher is talking about is about pulling your relationship with God out of emotions, period. Y'all hear me tonight? Now he preached the word. I'm saying what I'm saying because this is somebody's altar appeal. You keep succumbing to negative emotions because you keep limiting God to positive ones. And when you've made God vibes and energy and vibrations, then you end up dying by what you made God. And the word was it took death for, for Martha's dependency upon emotional response to die 
there were two deaths in the text. Lazarus and Martha's emotion. And this man of God stood here tonight flat-footed to tell you that while there are two deaths, there was only one thing raised from the dead. Lazarus gets to live. Your dependence upon emotional confirmation needs to stay dead. I don't know who really needs this word, and I haven't done this the whole time we've been together, but somebody who's honest about the fact that here lately you've been a, a little too much emotionally led than normal, you need to run to this altar. I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm not judging you. It might be one person. Maybe it's this time of year. Maybe it's the season. But there's somebody who's saying, Pastor, I'm admitting I'm like Martha. I've gotten so full of emotion that now it's, it's intercepting my theology. I know I heard God. I'm awaiting. I know I heard God. It's somebody in here. It's gotten to the point that now it affects my faith. See, God doesn't mind you having emotions. That's not the point. The point was that God doesn't want emotions to have you. And what we've learned to do is settle for a faith life that's emotional. So some of us shouting and don't mean it. And what we say, Hope, is I'm, I'm dancing by faith. No, you're dancing out of feelings because you don't want to appear dry. But if we were to peel back the layer of your real relationship with God, behind all of that, lift your hands and say something nice to the Lord, is a dry valley of bones. Because I'm disappointed. Because I thought being close to God would have resulted in something better than this. You better run to this altar tonight like your life is on fire. God loved you enough that he sent this word to tell you it's not the end. It's God's way of telling you that I exist beyond the place your grief dropped me. I'm greater than the place life dropped you off. I don't, I'm not here, not trying to perform a bunch of miracles. I'm not trying to be super deep. I promise I'm going to let you go in a few minutes. But I just felt too pressing upon me on this word. To, I can't just let this go and say, let's give God a hand praise for the preacher. No, this word was real for somebody. This was somebody's lifeline tonight. You needed to know that God is greater than where life has dropped your faith off. It ain't over until God says it's so. It ain't over until God says it's done. I'm going to pray for those at this altar. It ain't over until God says it's over. Keep fighting to your future. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray not only for those who are at this physical altar, but I pray for those who have made an altar right where they are, in their home, in their car, at the gym. Somebody's walking around in the grocery store with one earbud in their ear listening to this word tonight wherever faith may find them I pray right now that the Holy Ghost of God would arrest our space thank you Lord that tonight you're breathing possibility and fresh life I don't care how bad it's gotten I don't care how rough it seems I don't care how deep and dark and dismal the night I thank you Lord that your word for us tonight is that it is not the end.
that where we find ourselves is not finality that the comma in our life is not a period that the place the season that we're in is not the solution but that you are working things together for our good and yes for your glory I thank you tonight that you're using the worst of things to reveal the best of you Thank you that you're using, hallelujah to God. You're using the worst of things. There's nothing worse than death. You're using the worst of things to reveal the best of you. And I pray tonight for every hungry soul who wants more of you. Not just a feel good, not just the ability to, to have a better life, but I want more God in my life. I pray for everybody who wants more God in their lives. You would fill us up until we overflow. That you would allow our lives, God, to to, to live literally overflow an abundance of revelation show yourself mighty and show yourself strong in the midst of what we deal with I praise you tonight because I believe that your raising Lazarus from the dead is my sign that no matter what has been buried in my life anything you want alive you'll raise it back up again so I'm not afraid of the darkness and I'm not afraid of the dismal I'm not afraid of the disappointments and I'm not even afraid of the demonic because when God wants something to live God will raise it up again and I thank you tonight God for sending this word and this preacher to me to let me know that whatever I've been in is not over until you said it's over and God this is how I'm going to receive it I'm going to accept your word at face value I'm not going to fight it I'm not going to reason with it I'm not going to make you have to prove it to me I'm going to believe that you are Jesus the son of God I'm going to believe what you said about yourself without adding anything to it I trust you and that's enough I believe you and that's enough I trust you and that's enough and I thank you tonight because graves are opening up in the spirit all over this room and all over our lives graves are opening up in the spirit graves are opening up in the spirit dead places coming back to life impossible places coming back to possibility and I give you glory tonight I give you glory and praise that once again faith trumps feelings be glorified tonight we rest in you knowing that it is not over and it is not the end in Jesus name if you receive it and you surrender to it give God the very best praise you got right now any kind of praise any kind of praise any kind of praise any kind of praise you got come on any kind of praise you got oh it ain't over it ain't over until God says it's over until God says real good English but it's real good faith until God, until God says it's so over. keep fighting keep until you one more time somebody sing it from home it ain't over, it ain't over. Uh, until God says it's over Give God a hand clap of praise tonight. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the praise. My dear sister, come right on back. Come right up. I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot, I, I promise. But I, I, I heard something for you. The Lord's going to restore years back to your life. I don't know why, but I feel to some degree you feel like time was lost. And I 
I wish I could go back. You never had those moments, I just wish I could go back. You don't have to go back. God says, just go forward. And as you go forward, God, literally, I'm telling you, God is going to make up for lost time. You're going to feel like you're going to move at a really fast pace. Your faith is just going to pick up. It's going to go at a really fast pace. And, and I mean, almost uncontrollably fast. Like, God, okay, now hold on, Lord. This is too fast for me. Is God restoring you. And it's going to start on the inside. But here's how you know. It's going to manifest on the outside. In other words, God's going to start by restoring things that matter the most to your heart. Like your heart. But before it's done, God's going to send money back your way. Opportunity back your way. It's going to start with things like peace. And you'll see inner peace with no external difference. Just keep going. And it's not, here's the thing, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to let you go. It's not that the outer things matter the most. They really don't. They matter the least. That's the bonus because you kept going. God is going to restore you internally with what looks to be no external difference. And God sent you here in this season because this is a part of what is preparing you and helping to heal and helping to, to cultivate that ground to get you to open back up again. I want my wife, if you're okay with it, I, I want you to just wrap your arms around her real quick. Just hug her. We're, as a whole church, we're going to believe God. I mean, the whole church is going to believe God. I said the whole church is going to believe God. This is your season to be restored. This is your season to be restored. Every broken, shattered, torn space in your heart and mind. Be healed tonight in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo. This is why we come. This is what we come for. This is, this is why we're here. And this is what God will do when faith and expectation are in the room. Come on, thank God for God's preacher tonight. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm so godly proud. Come on up here. I'm, I'm, come on up here. I'm so godly proud of this man of God. And I'm going to tell you why. Well, I'm, I'm letting you go. Be seated one second. I'm letting you go. I promise we're out of here. I'm, I'm proud of him. Now, I'm proud of him for, him for two reasons, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use you as an ocular demonstration. Number one, I'm proud of him because though he is my friend, I've known him longer than I've pastored him. He allowed me to be his pastor, and he doesn't use pastor as a cloak for friendship. I got zero amens on that, but that's cool. In other words, he respects the spiritual authority. He's given spiritual authority for me to be able to speak into his life. So he's not just a buddy. He's a son. And I don't even play that father-son talk. You know me, no, I don't talk like that. But he submits like one, and I'm going to prove it. How long you been licensed? Seven years. I've been pastor in 10. So he's been licensed 70% of the time I have been a senior pastor. But he submitted to a year-long MIT class. Y'all missed that. He went backwards. And he comes from a credible ministry. His former pastor and I in a group chat, we text every day. So it ain't no hate. We text every day. Or almost every day. 
since the pandemic. But he saw something in, in the, he, he saw a necessity to start over and submit himself. And I'm saying this because we have a lot of preachers in our church and I come across a lot of preachers, period. And I, this is not a, a throw off at anybody. But anybody, anybody can want to be recognized. The question is, is are we willing to submit to process? And he did in a way that I normally don't require of ministers. And I want to say thank you for being so submissive to God's will for your life. And my prayer is that it's made you the better for it. Yeah. Second thing I'm going to say quickly that I admire about this man is you've preached your own journey tonight. You are a living witness. The word became flesh. And that's why it had that kind of effect. Because there's some stuff you can't preach from afar. You got to be willing to go through that to say that. And tonight you have proven that the best sermons are lived. And so my prayer for you, though you may have human grief, is that you will never go back to that grave again. I pray that tonight becomes a turning point for you. A testimony, not just an accomplishment or a moment where something went well. I pray tonight makes every confirmation and every part of affirmation necessary for your spirit that you will never again question who you are or why you are alive. In the name of Jesus, I affirm you publicly tonight as a father would affirm a son and I declare that your anointing and your purpose has been made evident in this earth. The torch has been lit and you're not permitted to abandon the fire. So I pray all the days of your life for as long as the word of God is fire shut up in your bones, you let it burn within you. In Jesus name, it is so tonight. Somebody who believes, shout, yes, Lord. Yeah, you got a right to celebrate. You got, <laughs> you got a right to celebrate. The enemy wanted to kill you and take you out, but the devil is a liar. And even tonight is not the end. This is just the beginning of what God's going to do in your life. We celebrate. So you can keep the old one because it has value. But tonight I'm proud as your man of God to present to you a new certificate of license that is given that God has called you into the gospel ministry and that you were licensed to preach the gospel. Today we recognize this day the seventh day of December though you were licensed to preach years ago we acknowledge this day seventh day of December the year of our Lord 2022 congratulations man of God we are well come on Let's uh
So y'all know what we do. I'm asking those of you online and those in the room who are able and willing, we want to sow a seed and be a blessing. Just whatever you have, no stress, no strain, no struggle. Want to be a blessing. You can make all of the information is on the screen. Whether you're online or in the room, you'll be able to see. We want to be a tangible blessing to the man of God who blessed us tonight. Um, what a moment. I'm just proud. Aren't y'all proud of these ministers who've gone forth in this last month? <laughs> My God. I'm so excited about where our church is right now. They had to drag me out of church Sunday. I thought I was going to, I just wanted to linger with all the ministers, license, and deacons being ordained, and church father and mother going forth. Thank God for Father Williams tonight in, in the house. Amen. It's, I, this is, these are happy times in our fellowship, and I'm grateful. Also, I just want to appreciate again the family who is here, family and friends of Minister Joseph. Thank you all for being here tonight. Grateful. Good to see you all supporters. I'm thankful to God and grateful. So if you can, be a blessing to him. We're going to sow and be a blessing to him tonight. If you don't know Christ and the free part of your sin, you ought to get to know him. You ought to meet him. And if you want to meet him tonight, you can do that. Pray with me, God, I come in Jesus' name and I pray that he would come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I believe you died for me and that you rose from the dead. And I believe that by your grace through my faith I am saved. Be Lord of my life and I will follow you forever. You prayed that prayer with me tonight for the first time. Why don't you text me POC decision to number 71441. If perhaps you need a church home you want to make this your home you want to grow with us you can text us at POC partner to number 71441 I'm so grateful for all of y'all being here tonight stand up come on I'm gonna let you go for AJ takes us in I missed you Sunday I, I, I missed it you real bad Now, church family, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to announce something. It's not bad news or anything. Um, if nothing else, I pray the last several Wednesdays and what we witness Sunday is uh, some measure of proof that uh, I have attempted to do my job this year. Would you agree? By the way, thank y'all so much for loving on Lady Nada and I for our birthday. I turned 20, she turned 82. Come on, give it up. It's a joke, y'all. Learn how to laugh. Yeah. I Claire, if she break away and start her own church, she gonna split the whole church. She got so many votes. No, thank you for the love you show. Now, here's what I'm gonna do. As many of you know, I'm working on my doctoral program. I, uh, I'm in the final stretches. Pray for me because it's January. I, I meet my academic advisor. January, I'm locking in for the final stretch. I spend the next five or six months just writing till my fingers fall off in what I pray will be a received final project. And uh, thus, uh, and we're going to pray for Minister Tan too because I think you're in that stretch too, aren't you? Almost one more year and you're in that stretch. So. Uh, pray for me. So with that stated, right, I'm trying to get myself together for January. So here's the reality. When I leave tonight, I am on sabbatical for the rest of the month. Now, I'm still preaching every Sunday in person. I will be here on Sunday, all right? But I am pastor on Sundays only. So if, if if now if the sky is falling and it's an emergency, trust me, I, I'll know. I don't have a problem with that. I'll always be available. But if the sky isn't falling, I'm going to ask that you let our pastoral team and our ministry team, they are happy to serve you. You saw all them preachers with collars on Sunday standing across the front. I, I'm going to ask that you do that. No, I'm not going to Italy or anything this year, but I need to rest my mind. Because the journey ahead is great. I feel like Elijah when God said, eat now. You're going to need this for 40 days, right? I, I need to just rest a little bit and relax. I promise I will be here Sunday morning fair and square. We got a word from God. 
already brewing in the pot, but outside of my preaching responsibilities, uh, I am going to take some time off to just get myself together because this next stretch of journey is going to be a lot. So can y'all help me gossip that out to the church, please? All right. Now, I guarantee it's going to be that one member that's going to test me. They do it every, all the time. Pa and here's how they start. Pastor, I know you want a break, but uh. So y'all help me, all right, to do that. I, I, I love y'all so much. I, I love you like I love bacon I shouldn't have. And I thank God for you. Lord, thank you tonight for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt and our lives have experienced. Thank you tonight for your presence in our space and thank you tonight for your anointing upon your preacher. I pray tonight not only that you restore his body and mind and spirit, but thank you for restoring ours through the word of God. Now, Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, we do not leave your presence. I pray we don't rob the Holy Spirit of those quiet, precious moments where you still whisper in our ear. Help us not to return so quickly to the hustle and bustle of life that we miss the final blessings. But I pray that we will hide these words in our heart that we may not sin against you. And until we come together again, let us live walking out what you spoke to us tonight, that this is not the end. And all who believe it, would you say amen? I love you with Jesus' joy. Have a strong week. Oh, Sister Katrina, come on up here. Since I see you, come on. She won the contest, and we owe you some money. I, I made a promise. I have to tell y'all, so the way this, the, the Do Good fundraiser works is the organization takes half, and then we get half. So all in all, y'all, in four days, we did, I think, $10,000, just about $10,000. You can clap for that. <laughs> and so we as a church get half of that, but we made a promise. She and Sister Yvonne Park were in such competition. It was, it was the Jews and the Christians and Acts going against each other. You know. Congratulations. I love you with the love of God. Be blessed tonight.